Good morning. I'm going to summarize views that I developed over the last 25 years. And given the time constraints, I will present my conceptual points probably in a more pointed way as they might be deserved to be handled. So please forgive me for uh, not contributing to the nuances that are behind all these things. I will be a rather, this will be rather a black and white picture, but sometimes it needs these black and white pictures for mental processes to proceed. So uh, I, I will touch on some conceptual issues, and the older I got, the more I felt concepts are important. The first one will be a, a provocation, as it's already written here. Uh, I, I believe for too long we have been obsessed by believing that photosynthesis drives growth, and I will hope to convince you that it's the other way around. Then I will talk about the central role of the nutrient cycle, then about this ongoing confusion of the carbon sequestration story that is commonly misunderstood. And finally, I will make a point on hydraulic failure, which became a hype, and I believe without a good reason. So, the problem with the carbon cycle, as we view the carbon cycle today, started here. This is the cradle of my own research. For the first 10 years of my career, I was obsessed measuring these response functions of photosynthesis, which is just the best food you can give to a model. A hyperbola, a parabola, uh, that's, all the, that, that's all they need. So if you have these three functions in your model at the top, you can model the production of sugar. So modelers love it. And that is where the problem began. Because this ignores the fact that for photosynthesis to continue, somebody needs to take the goodies. So unless from the site of synthesis, sugar is taken away and downloaded somewhere, the process of photosynthesis will be inhibited by end product <laughs> inhibition. And that causes phototoxicity and all sorts of things. This is the reason why under all conditions that are stressful for a plant, photosynthesis is the last and not the first process to be constrained. Uh, I put it in a cartoon shape, I said, well, Unless the tree takes over the sugar in some meaningful way, photosynthesis cannot go on. But the debate is still what is the mechanism behind. So the first point I want to make is that all life, including us as we sit here, needs about 22 essential nutrients. So without, if, if one of you in this room has no selenium, you would not be sitting here. So it's so simple, it's so trivial, it's so fundamental also that from looking at this picture that you know from your school days makes it already clear that unless you have all these 22 essential elements present, carbon alone can do nothing. Now, I tried to encapsulate the classical way of thinking, the mechanistic way of thinking how plant grows and productivity come about. I put an old and a new vision, and I can see the red color is hardly visible. So on the left column, you see at the top photosynthesis as a function of, for instance, carbon dioxide, as the driver of everything that follows. And if you go down from there, there comes in a modulation by water, by nutrients, by timing, by temperature, etc. Then you end up by growth, different for different species. And finally, you have a feedback uh, from respiration and net primary production as the main driver of respiration. You end up with GPP that nobody can measure. So whoever claims he has measured GPP, this is simply wrong. You can only calculate GPP. And for that, you need some NEE data from an Ediflux tower or photosynthesis data. Now, if you move to the Meristem way of concept, then you see that at the top is the machinery that forms cells. That means enlarging, producing embryonic cells, enlarging cells, 
building a cell wall, fortifying these lignin cases. And then this process itself is controlled by turgor, by availability of new nutrients. Think of mortar when you build a house, you need only cannot build a house from brick only, you need mortar. Uh, timing, when you are flowering, you're not growing. Phenology comes in here, temperature. And then eventually, when all these conditions are fulfilled, extra CO2 could also add. But this is a situation in a tomato greenhouse under horticultural conditions, not in the field. So I put it in this simple way. There are sources for carbon and there are sinks for carbon. And the old way, the way I grew up with and spent much of my early career was the green curve. I think it will take a generation almost for the community to accept that the red line is the important one. But, uh, of course, you cannot decouple the two processes in the long run, only in the short term. And because the green line, so that the, the line the line that goes from the source to the sink is so dominant in all modeling, all models, as the English say, are dressing the horse from the tail. And that is why the models fail so fundamentally that the modeling community itself realizes that something must be fundamentally wrong. This is a review by a modeling community. They tested a number of models and they arrived at concluding that the way they do it must be so wrong that they are wrong by an order of magnitude to, in hindcast, reconstruct a CO2 fertilization effect at the global scale. So I recommend that Hunzinger et al. paper, 2017 in Scientific Reports. It's a, a product of the modeling community itself. So let me summarize this. For elevated CO2 in the atmosphere to stimulate plant growth, carbon must be a growth limiting resource. However, if resources other than carbon are constraining growth, CO2 will be absorbed on demand to the extent these other resources permit. And this is a sink limitation based concept. So if I could tattoo something in your brain, this would be one of my tattoos. The carbon cycle is fundamentally linked to the nutrient cycle. There's no way you can have carbon cycling without nutrient cycling. And why should carbon the mastermind I think the nutrients are driving this process. So to test this, we had a lot of money from the Swiss Science Foundation over 12 years. We were trying to use the most realistic system you could to test the theory whether carbon is limiting or not. We built a 15 meter tall crane and we had a lot of CO2 gas emitted to the tree canopy with a highly automated system. And we did this in both the citrus trees and in evergreens, and in no case did we found any stimulation of tree growth. Because we did not fertilize this forest. We repeated the experiment with spruce, 40 meter tall trees, 115 years old, uh, the entire canopy, canopy enveloped with elevated CO2, and the effect was zero again. And we are not alone. The, the only few people tested the CO2 fertilization hypothesis in what I call coupled system. Coupled systems are systems where the nutrient cycle is coupled to the productivity, leaf litter production, root turnover, no nutrients added, the soil not disturbed. It's a steady state system that is driven by the nutrient cycle. And under these conditions, if you use the pre-treatment conditions to standardize the data, which is important, you see no effect. The same was found uh, if you don't add nutrients in boreal forest by Sigurdsson and Suna Lindus group, uh, by L. David Ellsworth in Australia, and by Rich Nobe in Oak Ridge with the famous Oak Ridge phase. The big cent I would say the central question is, and no soil biologist could so far give me an answer. Why are there so much, so many nutrients 
are trapped in soil organic matter that is not taking part in the daily business of providing plants with nutrients. And only a small fraction of that soil organic matter is cycling. Would there be a shift from that small fraction of rapidly cycling nutrients that feed net primary production towards that slow one, there would be a leeway. There would be some space for CO2 to have an effect. And we simply do not know what is controlling the fractionation between these two pools, a huge but recalcitrant soil organic matter full of nutrients and a small fast cycling pool. Is it clay content? We don't know. So I put it in this uh, cartoon in a recent paper in tree physiology. People always hope to sequester carbon to the soil. I mean, if somebody lives in hopes that this would be a good idea, I would like to remind you that if you look at the nutrient to carbon ratio, soil is the last, the worst place where you would wish carbon to go. There's no other place in an ecosystem that is more expensive in terms of nutrients than soil organic matter. The C to nitrogen ratio, for instance, is 15 in soils. So you need an enormous amount of nutrients that are not further available for plant growth if you sequester carbon to the soil. While in tree stem, the ratio is between 200 and 400. So tree stems are by far the cheapest way in terms of nutrients to sequester carbon. And the leaf canopy is too small, a pool that doesn't matter. So let me put this into three statements. The rate of tissue formation most commonly controls the rate of carbon assimilation. That is a 180 degree in shift of paradigm. Tissue formation is controlled by the most limiting resource, which commonly is not carbon. And more productive forests commonly store less carbon because they have an enhanced turnover. This brings me to a topic I will touch upon in a minute, uh, the, the, the central role of carbon residence time. So there is no indication in the real world that carbon is a gross limiting resource for natural forest at current CO2 concentrations. But this was the basic hypothesis for all what we did with experiments with elevated CO2. So we do need to shift the paradigm to understand plant growth and the ecosystem carbon balance. We need to understand stand and model sink activity, but we experimentalists did not deliver the sort of parameters that you need to parameterize a model with factors that drive cell production. That's something out of our uh, scope and simply because we have no instruments. And I'm, I'd like to make the point that much of our conceptual world in science is driven by the availability of instruments and tools and we tend to ignore processes for which we have no, uh, no tools. So source-driven growth models, they may yield plausible results. I quote Fatici for this, either by coincidence, by parameter fitting, tuning, or because of autocorrelation, that means for the wrong reason. And I was very pleased to see in May this year a big consortium of people arriving at the conclusion uh, that are what we measure with, for instance, any covariance or with other techniques in terms of carbon uptake does not match tree growth. So we quantified source sink relations across biomes by combining any covariance cross prime production with extensive on-site and regional tree ring elevation observations. We found widespread and temporal decoupling between carbon assimilation and tree growth, underpinning, underpinned by contrasting climatic sensitivities of these uh, two processes. Uh, there, there's still one of the paradigms that I want to nibble on, only with this single slide. People still run around and believe that in a high C2 world, leaf area index should go up. 
by all logics, it should go down because if you provide more from one resource, the plant usually allocates its resources to the more limiting ones, which would be below ground and not above ground. But thanks to a number of papers, we know that this illusion of a rise of, of LAE does not exist in the real world. It was often mistaken that plants that receive elevated CO2 ramp up a little bit faster under horticultural conditions than un CO2 enriched plants, but that was only because the census was taken in the expansive phase rather than in the steady state phase. So the old bridge phase ended up just as any other, our own phase ended up with the litter production is constant, the leaf area index is constant or rather declining. But you can see tons of models that assume it should go up. I just want to make one point about leaf area index. Uh, in a canopy of plants, whether this is a wheat field or an oak forest, it doesn't matter. Hardly any leaf is operating at light saturation. So within the canopy, there's the process of photosynthesis is always light limited. And from that, people would assume that if you have more leaves, uh, there might be more photosynthesis. But that is an illusion that was falsified 30, 50 years ago. It is known that what is called canopy conductance for evapotranspiration, but also for CO2 uptake, saturates around a leaf area index of 3.5. So if you can go beyond this, this is, must have other reasons than optimizing NPP. This is also why agriculture usually optimizes at LAE of around 4 and not beyond. So if you have a beech forest with an LAI leaf area index of 6, you may wonder why this is so. You can remove half of the foliage and then primary production would not be changed. It seems like evolution selected for this high leaf area index for competition reasons. So the species that has more leaf area shades out its neighbors and thus increases its own fitness. But leaves are also a bank account for spare nutrients. If you have to replace foliage, you have already the nutrients in your body. You don't have acquired the nutrients freshly in competition with others from the soil. And if there's herbivory, you are buffered against leaf losses. So we need to depart from the idea that evolution had optimized leaf area index for carbon capture. I, I believe competition is a much more plausible uh, explanation. So, let me briefly touch on the issue that many people still believe that rising uh, growth rates for whatever reason, warming, watering, nutrients, CO2, means sequestering carbon. The term carbon sequestration is the most misused term in the current debate in ecology. People don't define their terms and you are welcome to interpret these terms as you wish. You may sequester the carbon from the chloroplast to, uh, to a starch grain, that is sequestration. You may sequester it to a growing tissue, but you may sequester it to a whole forest or to the whole globe. You need to define the mean residence time that you allow things um, uh, for, for things to be allowed to to be termed by sequestration. Sequestration means just putting from one place to another place. It doesn't mean that it stays in the other place. So I made the point years ago that should there be a growth enhancement, the stock of carbon, and that's the only thing that matters to mitigate atmospheric CO2 enrichment, must go up. But if the turnover rate is enhanced by growth, the stock will go down. So let me cap, um, cap, catch this in this cartoon. There are three hypotheses. If for whatever reason a tree in the forest grows faster, I have three hypotheses. The first one is a stupid one, but I put it here for completeness. The first one assumes if a tree grows faster and it reaches its dis evolutionary design size, the tree stays and waits until time, co time comes to die. Uh, may, may occur. I, I don't think this is plausible. Hypothesis two is the hypothesis that the tree grows bigger, bigger as it grew in the past. That would be a funny evolution that all our trees don't reach the size they were designed for. But there's a, maybe a small leeway to grow a little bit bigger. I don't mean in a managed system, but in a natural system. 
Finally, the most plausible way is that if you grow faster, you turn over faster. You start flowering and fr fruiting earlier and your life cycle simply goes faster. And I was so pleased to see this confirmed by Brian et al. very recently in a, in a huge meta-analysis across the world. On the left panel you see an analysis just for spruce for Pizza Mariana in the US. And on the right hand side you see the net outcome of this meta-analysis. Net primary production is, listen sharply, net primary production is negatively correlated to carbon stock. But it is the carbon stock that we want to rise to relieve the atmosphere from carbon. So whenever a system grows faster, this means the actual meaningful sequestration goes down. And you may have heard and read a thousand times that people claim because they saw something is growing faster, there is more carbon sequestration. It is the opposite. If a tree grows faster, if a parcel of trees uh, produces faster, it will be harvested either earlier by the manager because they go for a certain tree size or uh, the overall ontogeny of the tree runs fast and the tree turns over faster. So I strongly suggest for those who believe that growth has anything to do with carbon sequestration to read Breen and Edal 2020 in Nature Communications. So we may categorize ecosystems in two, in, in, in two categories and, and there may be all intermediate stages. There is the fast uh, rates with the small pools uh, category. This means fast nutrient and carbon cycle, a lower carbon pool, early successional species, high litter quality. And on the right side, you have the slow and large pool, slow cycling system, higher carbon pool size, late successional taxa, lower litter quality. And succession is, of course, uh, moving systems normally from the left side to the right side. So the speeding of cycling, that is net primary production or growth, is commonly negatively correlated with carbon sequestration because it is the mean residence time in the system that matters. And that includes even our human-made uh, uh, stores of carbon in timber. It's not the rate at which we build houses of carbon, it's the duration of the carbon staying in that pool. Everybody will agree that uh, you cannot draw any conclusion to the size of these reservoirs if you know the flow in and flow out. But this is the common paradigm. You can Every week you can see papers, even in Nature and Science, where people make a claim, they found a rate change and therefore there's carbon sequestration. There's no logical basis for such a statement. And we should simply stop using the word carbon sequestration, except if we clearly define what we mean. What matters is the capital of carbon that is stored in ecosystems rather than the flux rate at which carbon cycles through our systems by processes we call growth, respiration, photosynthesis, etc. So I grew up, and I guess most of you grew up with the belief that stomata control assimilation in such a way that when water is short, the plant becomes short in carbohydrates. I'm sorry to say that we all believed in this without the data. I refer to classical works by um, um, John Lloyd or by, uh, by uh, uh, Chow and others that show very old, old in the 60s and early 70s that whenever trout seeps into a plant system, it is the growth that collapses before assimilation. And as a consequence, whenever a plant is under drought, the carbon pool of non-structural carbohydrate goes up rather than down. We learned the stomata helped the plant to make the compromise between starvation and thirst. That is, I guess, most of you learned in school and in university. But this was an assumption without data. This assumption was based on the belief photosynthesis is driving growth. But if growth is driving photosynthesis and the turgor of 0.6 megapascal is enough to stop mary stems to expand their cells, then you run into an overflow situation under drought. And this is excellently reviewed by Bertrand Müller and others for many crop species and tree species. Under all cases ever examined, 
growth is more sensitive to water shortage than photosynthesis. I skip this slide, or perhaps I say this is an experiment by Günther Hoch in Basel, where he exposed these uh, different tree species as seedlings to drought under various light regimes. And just the red bars always mean the droughted plants and the black is the control. Without, with two exceptions, the droughted species, the individuals always had more carbohydrates than the control. So my final point is another hype that is hard to remove from the literature. It started about 15 years ago when people made the point that when drought comes in, and we heard a lot about the likelihood of drought here in, 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 in the Czech Republic, uh, the trees will suffer because the conduits get blocked by embolism. And this is a fundamentally non-logic way of reasoning. And I will try to explain why this makes no sense. Uh, so the hypothesis is there, supported by data, that a mean loss of 50% of xylem conductivity is reached at a certain water potential. And when you measure this water potential in angiosperms or gymnosperms, you can assume that half of the conduits are lost. And this loss of conductivity is supposed to kill a tree. Now, you can expect that the xylem of a tree is designed to meet the demand of water transport for maximum transpiration. I would say it's probably over that it's over dimension. So the capacity is bigger than maximum transpiration because there may be damage of the xylem. Uh, anyway, we take this as 100%. Once the stomata have closed, you need only 1% to 2% of conductivity to supply the leaf and to maintain turbo. So how could a 50% loss of conductivity be fatal when you need only 1% to 2%. It makes absolutely no sense. So when the stomata are closed, the tree is like a plastic bag, transpiring, transpiring very, very little. And the key event is, uh, as in this cartoon, and I put this in this tree physiology paper for those who want to read more about this, is the disruption of the capillary continuum between the soil matrix and the root surface. When this happens, a cascade of things happen. So if you have a hepatitis, you may get yellow, but nobody would believe that your yellow color is it that makes you sick. And it's the same with embolism. Embolism is one of the processes that occur when a tree loses its water supply in the soil. And if you lost 50%, this is still 50 times more than you need to please the or to match the cuticular transpiration. I think uh, this is a good point to uh, think of Jan Czermak, who was one of the few who had this broader view of plant-water relations. Unfortunately, we lost Jan uh, recently, and uh, there's a nice uh, paper where Reinhard Koelmann was involved. Uh, I I'm just showing one of his um, examples that is actually backed up by old wisdom. What matters when drought seeps into a forest is how much water, available, physiologically available water, is stored in the tree at the time of complete stormal closure. If you know that freely available water, that is the water between uh, uh, the, the content at the point of stormal closure and the water content that is fatal, which is usually 50% of physiologically active parenchyma cells, they can, they die when they lose more than 50% of water. That amount of water in the tree becomes easily available once a few embolisms occur, because then the surrounding parenchyma can just suck the water without tension. As long as the capillary continuum is continuous, or it's under high tension, but as soon as there are some air bubbles, that apoplastic water becomes freely available and can help the tree to survive maybe another month. Uh, some people feel for New Mexico, or uh, there's a paper that maintains it may be three months. That is the ultimate security of the tree, but the tree dies when the protoplasts dehydrate by more than 50% and not when some of the capillaries lost their conductivity. Roots are really the key, 
and they are not where we normally have our instruments because all these trees out there they root several meters deep only with a small fraction of their roots the majority of roots is where our sensors are sitting but the key roots are the ones where we have no sensors uh, I'm not saying embolism is completely a fata morgana type of thing it does occur and it may have fatal consequences when it occurs in the terminal branches as has been found for beech that embolizes to such an extent in the terminal twigs that they cannot refill and then we see these very badly looking beaches after a severe drought as we had in 2018. So let me summarize this. First, I hope I convinced you that photosynthesis is not a driver but a process driven by demand set by nutrients, water and temperature except if you uh, add all these resources in a horticultural setting. All environmental drivers, except for deep shade, affect meristems first, that is long before they affect gas exchange. And CO2 fertilization is confined to a horticultural growth setting. So if you dig up the ground, if you space seedlings, uh, then, of course, there is leeway for extra CO2 to cause more growth, but not in a coupled system in nature. Carbon sequestration is negatively related to growth rate or NPP, and it is defined by carbon residence times. Just be, in, be aware that carbon sequestration is, in 99% of the cases in the literature, a misused and misleading term. So models that do not capture point one to four, they must fail because they are not building on the hierarchy of mechanisms as we know them today. And plant-water relations under drought are controlled by the soil root capillary continuum. We have no instrument to measure this with embolism, just a side effect rather than the ultimate cause. And I skip the last point, that would be another lecture that stress and limitation concepts that come from agronomy should not be applied to eco ecology. Uh, I thank you for your attention. I repeat.